Okay, so all you really need to do, Christopher, is make sure it doesn't stop. Blinking red light stops, we have a problem. <laughs> all right, so, the Hexiart project. Um, whole thing starts in 1995, when I go and visit a place called The Farm in Tennessee. Uh, and The Farm started in 1971 with 200 school buses that drove out of San Francisco because they thought the world was going to end. Mm -hmm. And they made a convoy all the way across America to uh, Tennessee, just past Memphis, near uh, Nashville. And in Tennessee, they bought 1,500 acres of land by putting together a whole bunch of different people's inheritances and ran the most successful of the big hippie communes. Uh, it had a total open door policy, so anybody could come and anybody could stay as long as they liked. If you stayed longer than a couple of months, you had to give them everything you owned in the whole world, and you were not going to get it back if you left. Nice. But you could come. It's what we did here. Also. Yeah. Yeah. After, was that 30, 36 hours? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I went there in 95, and the place was a wasteland. It was just desolate. They'd gone bankrupt. They had terrible social problems, nobody liked each other anymore, the entire thing had gone completely ass backwards because they didn't really understand what they were doing and they tried to run the whole thing on faith and optimism rather than engineering and reason. Uh, which is not to say they didn't do some very good engineering and some very good reason, but it was a mess. So I arrived there and I'm about 25 and I'm looking for truth and trying to figure out what's important in the world and they sit me down and they completely destroy my life in about two weeks. <laughs> the first thing they do is they teach me about the environment. Oh, by the way, everything is completely screwed. Within your lifetime, the world is going to be fucked. Terrible things will happen. You're going to have to get a grip on this. Second thing they do is they say, by the way, every time we build a geodesic dome, we waste two thirds of the, uh, uh, we waste a third of the materials because all Buckminster Fuller's funny triangles don't fit on the dome, uh, uh, or don't fit on the 4x8 sheet, right? So the panel materials, right, that's a, that's a 4x8 panel there, right, that, that bit there, 4x8 panel. The panel materials are a poor fit for the triangles of the dome, right? How is it going to work? And I'm like, huh, I don't know. So I spend about six months working on it, because I know the appropriate math, don't solve the problem, but it stays in the back of my head, and in 2002 I have a breakthrough, and I design the Hexier, right? This, this thing here, that. And at the time, I, I'm smart enough to recognise that it's important, right? The, this thing is actually easy to build, and what I should do is I should figure out how to get lots of them all over the world for all those poor bastards without any place to live. Maybe I'll start a company. I could, I could patent it, and I could get production and I could and I could learn how to be a manufacturing engineer and I could I could actually make them and I could sh and, and I kind of got into the list of dependencies for doing that and realized it was going to turn me into somebody that I'm just not so it was a choice of either find another way of doing it or become somebody else so I decided I'd try and do it open source and just give the bloody thing away and hope that other people would figure out that it was good and use it for things preferably proper humanitarian things not just pissing around in the desert and in 2002, there was one hex year, and in 2003, there was one or two hex years, and in 2004, there were maybe four or five hex years, and it doubled every year, more or less. So 2010, there were about 60 hex years at Burning Man. Do you guys all know what Burning Man is? Yeah, yes. right? Huge rave in the desert, lasts nine days, 50,000 people camping, the whole bit. So in 2010, there were 60 hex years at Burning Man. And in 2011, they were a bit over 600. Mm. Oh, mm. Mm. right, not bad. Uh, I don't know how many there'll be this year, but we've sold out all of the tape suppliers in America for making hex yurts. Mm -hmm. There's just no tape left anymore. All of the <laughs> tape has been sold of the kind that you need to build them for temporary use. None left. Um, the actual breakthrough, the, the, you know, the magic of the hex yurt, is not very complicated. Is there a stick somewhere I can use for pointing at things? Yeah, pick one. Oh, stick, stick. So that panel is 2.4 meters by 1.2 meters, and that triangle is 1.2 meters by 2.4 meters. It's just half a panel. So the total instruction for building your hexiart is take six panels, cut them in half in the diagonal, and assemble them into a shallow cone. 
And, you know, the weird thing is, out of all the smart things that I've ever done, that's the only thing anybody will ever remember after I'm dead. Oh yeah, he was the guy who worked out you had to cut the paddles in half. I, 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 why was that a big deal? I can't even remember. Right. So that is the essence of what we're doing. Right. It's making these complicated buildings simple. Now, uh, I have to try and change to the other window. Excuse my piracy, I'm just trying to find... There we are... <clears throat> We've built them up to there. All of these ones are speculative, we don't know for sure if they'll work or not. <laughs> but. All of them are built on the same principle and all of them produce zero waste. Mm -hmm. So we went out to solve a simple problem, how do you build domes without any waste? And instead we've got this huge family of architectures that are actually, I think, seven people who designed these now. Mm -hmm. So you know, I designed that one and that one and that one. And so that, these two are Edwin, and that one is Dylan and that one is Dylan and that one is Dylan and that one is Dylan. That one is a guy, you know, those two, the first two, I don't even know those guys very well. They just showed up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've actually got a proper design commons that's making a whole series of impossibly interesting things happen, largely through this very, very, very lazy, slack, patient, playful approach. You know, you invent a new hex yurt with a pair of scissors and some paper and you cut out lots of little shapes, and at the end of it, maybe you have something that is new and maybe you have something that changes the world. Uh, the very little one at the beginning, not the tiny one that looks like a little tent, but the one after that, I think is going to be the first production hex here, because it's just perfect. Uh, go on, where are you? That one. Right? Four sheets of material for a little two-person shelter. Beautiful work. Hardly any cutting. Now... No, not that. <clears throat> Muddy computers. Right. So, uh, these are the three rules of software, right? The, what makes a great programmer? Laziness, impatience, hubris. So, what laziness, you don't like working too hard, so you find an easy way to do it. Impatience, you want to do it in a hurry, largely because you're lazy. And mm. hubris, you know, you're Greeks, so you ought to know what that word means. What, how do you pronounce it? Hubris? I don't know that word. Yeah, well, radical ambition of the kind that gets you smacked down by the gods. Ah, okay. Right? You want to change the world, so you do engineering. Right? Architects are supposed to be slow and patient and lots of other, you know, artistic and creative and all the rest of that stuff. But the big problems that we have in the world are not that we have boring buildings, it's that we have no buildings for people who need buildings. And that is a problem that we can solve. Um, Christopher, is that camera definitely still running? Yeah. Good. Camera paranoia. We've seen those. Right, I don't know, yeah, yeah. lots of hex yards. okay, this is a bit interesting. So, same design, new material. The first ones that you saw, the silver ones, were made of insulation panels. This stuff is plywood. So for the plywood one, right, um, you see here we have it lapping. The panels are overlapped slightly all the way around. That's so you can make it waterproof. And to hold it together, we use these little blocks. So you see these are just cut off a piece of lumber. Uh, you know the stuff I mean, right? Two by four? Yes. And two by four and all your wood is weird European sizes. Anyway, you take a piece of wood, even weird European sizes, you just cut it to the angle and that's the block that holds the entire structure together. So for an all wood building that's big enough to sleep five people fairly comfortably, 12 sheets of plywood, 5 pieces of 2x4, and 160 deck screws. US price is about $87. So, a disaster relief tent, which is that size, costs about $350. Roughly a quarter of the price of a tent. And that means you can just bang the damn things out. If you have a natural disaster and some people with some training, you have the disaster, you buy the plywood from the industrial supply chain, you make as much shelter as you need to, really, really, really quick, really easy. By the time somebody's built a hex yard as a helper two or three times, they're ready to lead a construction team and start training people. 
so you can do theoretically tens of thousands of hex yards in a couple of days because the spread of the knowledge is viral and the tools are very easy to find in container quantities. You know, if you call the guys who manufacture uh, skill saws, you know, handheld power saws, and say we need 50,000 units for an emergency in two weeks, they can find it for you out of the global supply chain. You don't even need 50,000, 5,000 is enough. Do you see how this begins to become interesting? Like, you know, it's not just that you can scavenge the materials and build one unit out of scrap, and it's not just that you could go down and you could buy enough to build two or three units and do them nicely out of, you know, good OSB or whatever. It's that if you have a really huge crisis that involves relocating entire cities or 150 million climate refugees, we already make all the materials you need and you can scale it as fast as you have to. And it's that ability to scale the solution into a crisis of almost any size that is the core of the work that I'm doing. What I'm trying to do is make sure that we have a system to catch the world if it falls. Right? Hard collapse is very possible. If it happens, we're going to have to move a billion people back onto agricultural land or they're going to starve in their cities. And you start looking at technologies like this and you say, actually, if you start thinking of this as where you put them, you build one of these every hectare over the entire agricultural area of Europe and if you have no oil, no gas, no national grid, and not much money, the people will at least probably survive. You've got to insulate them. You can insulate them in lots of different ways, basically improvised. We had people live through the winter in London in a wooden hex yard, and they just stapled blankets all over the inside in two or three layers, and they said it was the warmest winter they'd ever spent outdoors. Mm. You weren't really outdoors anymore, you were in a hex yard. And it's this ability that makes the hex yard politically and strategically important because it means that we've got the ability to fan the entire population back out into the fields in the event of a crisis that would require it, and there are some crises in which that becomes possible. If you see a real war in the Middle East around Iran and the Iranians retaliate by dropping bombs on the oil terminals, uh, oil will be $500 a barrel. Nice timing with the car. Uh, oil will be $500 a barrel before you even blink. All right. Um, any questions about hex yards, or shall we move on to other things? Yeah, let's build one. Okay, well we can take a crack tomorrow. This, by the way, is the first hex yard that was ever built. Burning Man 2003. Here's the little solar panel that's driving a, an evaporative cooler. Uh, that, believe it or not, is my ex-wife. Right, I should have taken that out of the picture. Uh, and this is the hex yard with its little squares, and it was made of cardboard and tinfoil. It's a long time. Um, so we've seen all of these. Whee! Uh, is from you? No, not me. Are you sure? Definitely not. Um, so, <laughs> your kitchen. Uh, Weird. Maybe behind. Quick, run! Right. So, the other thing uh, is, well, two things about that. Actually, three. So, the first is you can make folding hex yards, flat package. Pull on the sides, pop there's a little building. Lovely. Second thing is German army. Right? The only people that have ever solidly supported <laughs> the Hex Europe project, the people that have really helped me every step along the way, the people that have always been there when I needed them, the people that have actually delivered when I had a problem, are the Pentagon. Mm. Right? All the aid NGOs like the Red Cross, all of the you know various kinds of commercialization possibilities, and a fair number of the hippie freaks, everybody has dropped the ball every time they were handed to it, apart from the American military, which has always said, we think the Hexier is great, but hey, we'll do anything we can to get that thing into production. So, you know, part of my loyalty to the American military, which is a very unfashionable group to have any loyalty to at all, given the mass murder spree they've been on, uh, is they genuinely have been very good to this project for reasons that I've never really understood. Maybe it has a secret fascist ap application. Uh, that's what a hex shirt looks like uh, when it's flat packed if you make it in nice materials. Uh, another folding hex yurt, this time full size. See that whole roof cone is a single piece. Um, I don't know if you guys believe in trade and actually doing things for money, but <laughs> A folding hexier factory would be not that big, it's a light industry and it's potentially quite a nice way of exporting an idea as well as a thing that people would buy. Just thought. <clears throat> now, all make sense? 
All right, any questions? Yes. Okay, what do you want to know? What thing about the army? Yeah. <laughs> what about the army? What happened with that project? Okay, so the Hexier became part of the inspiration for a thing called Star Tides. Uh, Star Tides runs out of U.S. National Defense University. I still don't trust me, it. <laughs> I, I just don't... I, I'm almost paranoid about the camera, because I have the rule of never speak except on video, uh, because otherwise you tend to repeat yourself and you forget that, you know, you should always be innovating. So if you lose the recording, at that point it's as if you never spoke and then you have to repeat yourself. You have to record and you have to document. Document, document, document. So, Star Tides runs at U.S. National Defense University. Uh, it's run by a former, very senior Pentagon thinker. Uh, <coughs> he used to manage a budget of thirty billion dollars, which is like three percent U.S. tax revenue. Crazy. Uh, and they do well. I can show you what they do. Pictures worth a thousand words, right? This, um, this is a university of military. So this is a document I did for those guys uh, for uh, uh, the first Tides demonstration. Isn't that a great picture? Look at that. I picked that picture myself. <laughs> a certain amount of propaganda was required. You set up that picture. No, no. <laughs> so we were talking about you know these large scale risks, right? Here's Joe Survivor. He's trying not to die in a crisis. Look at this dodgy looking defense contractor standing outside of a free tent. All the things they put inside the tent to help you. Uh, Hexier. Oh, we love that. Um, uh, look at that. Fort McNair, right on the bank of the Potomac. Big military installation. Domes, shelter systems. You guys have probably looked at these? No? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Right? Uh, Unifold. Very clever technology. Too expensive. So they did this thing, right? You know, here's all the solar cookers they brought to the demonstration. This thing over here, lovely piece of technology, wappy. It's a little piece of wax, and it melts once your water reaches the critical temperature for solar disinfection. Mm -hmm. So you put the indicator in in one condition, when the water gets hot enough, the thing melts and drops out the bottom, so you always know whether your water is safe. Very, very clever. A whole bunch of different stove technologies that they had. Uh, solar power, all kinds of bits and pieces, right? Uh, this is a dead clever thing. Uh, it's called a sleep breeze. So it's a little box of electronics, a fan, and a sock with holes in it. And it's held open by a spi uh, plastic spiral. So it blows a continuous belt of air over your body for about 15 minutes to let you get to sleep, and then it turns off again. So with eight AA batteries, you could get about a month of cooling and it's actually about as effective as air conditioning for getting to sleep. And once you're asleep, you don't really care if you're too hot. Very simple, very effective. Um, so they took all of this technology, composting toilets and alternative sanitation, and they took this stuff and they built it in a field in the middle of America, uh, right in the heart of the defense industrial complex, and they showed it to people. And they got such a good reception, they did it the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year. And I think this will be about the sixth year they've done it. Doesn't make any sense to me either, but that is actually what's happening. Um, they're also very interested in infrastructure decentralization, right? So, you know, this was uh, this was before I invented the critical infrastructure map. So this is the old Rocky Mountain Institute infrastructure model: electrical, gasoline, natural gas, water supply, sewage, telecom. And you can see you've built some parts of these systems for yourself, right? Yeah, you know, composting toilets is your sewage. You don't have a natural gas supply, but it might turn into uh, biogas, gasoline supply you're not substituting for, electrical power, <coughs> solar and wind, sewage uh, process we talked about, telecom could be mesh networks. So, you know, the notion that the core of these systems are extremely fragile, that that stuff could just get wiped out, is exactly the experience that the US military's had in Iraq. All of the critical infrastructure got wiped out, the country completely collapsed, and then they just looked at each other and said, what the hell do we do now? So, um, uh, what else to say? I mean, it's a tiny project inside of a huge institution. The huge institution has killed maybe a million people in the past 10 years. Uh, they reopened prison camps of a kind that we haven't really seen since the Nazis. Uh, what can you say?
right? A small piece of uncorrupted uh, content inside of a very bad, big, big machine. Any more questions about that, or shall we move on to something more fun? Yeah, what happened in Iraq? <laughs> well, I mean, the truth, right, is... And Seriously. Since you asked. So, George Bush the I invades Kuwait to drive Saddam Hussein back into Iraq. That's the first Gulf War. And George Bush the I writes a very nice piece of analysis where he says, look, if we go into Iraq, it's going to be an absolute disaster. It's going to turn into a quagmire. We've got no way of holding Iraq together as a single country after an invasion. It's going to turn into a civil war. We're going to be stuck there for two generations, sorting it out. We have no way of uh, maintaining the peace if we do this, so we're not going to go to Baghdad. And everybody said, ah, you're a coward. What an idiot. You know, ah, we should do it. And George Bush I, who was a really evil man in a lot of ways, knew that they couldn't win and didn't start it. George Bush II, being in every way a better man than his father, honest governor, uh, started the war, everything that George Bush I had predicted happened, and the result is that a million people are dead, for absolutely no gain for the US at all. So it's not just that it was an immoral war, it's not just that it was an evil war, it was a stupid war. And they've got nothing to show for having blown three trillion dollars and a hundred thousand of their own people, never mind the civilian casualties on the other side. Um, the original, you know, deeply evil but very competent people that used to run America knew not to start wars like that and it's the later generation Muppets that have actually fucked the entire game. Um, if you're gonna have empires they should at least be competent. Yeah. Best empire is no empire but if you're gonna have an empire they ought to at least be smart. Uh, well, I'll show you one more Hexiart related bit. There we are. So Hexhertz at Burning Man from the, oh, yeah, that. You, you've mostly seen that picture. The big Hexhertz. Hexhertz at Burning Man from the aerial pictures. All over the bloody place. So, you know, open source turns out to work. You, know, you could get a lot of change by spreading ideas. So, uh, do you want to do this in English or Greek? You probably can't read the slides in any case. Do you want to have a crack at focusing that a little more, see if it helps? Yeah, might be, might be we could get a little point of focus, that's good, yeah, lovely, not going to help very much. So this I, is the I other... Would, I would put it up in Greek. You want it in Greek? No, oh. most people here are not Greek. Greek, leave, not leave, Greek. Leave it like that. No. No Greek, okay, no Greek. no Greek. Right, so this is a thing that came out the back of this Hexiart project, which is called Simple Critical Infrastructure Maps, or the dartboard of death. <laughs> so, what you have here is six ways that people could die. And the reason you want to know how people die is so that you could keep them alive in a crisis. If you cover every single way that people die and they don't let it happen, the people stay alive until they die of old age. Six ways that people die. Too hot, too cold, hunger, thirst, illness, injury. That's all there is. Alien invasion. Alien invasion, death by injury. <laughs> death rays are still an injury, we do count those. Lack of air. Lack of air. In most cases I would call that an injury. Illness. Could you could call it an illness. Could call it an illness. Depends what causes the lack of air. Okay. Alien invasion, they suck all the air out of your planet, you die, it's definitely injury. <laughs> so when you break it down to only six things that you need to cover it opens up a lot of creative space because we've made the, simple, the problem simple enough to actually think about rather than just to rely on patterns. Okay, how am I going to stop myself dying from being too hot? There must be 50 different ways that I could cool myself down. And it becomes kind of a design challenge and it becomes something with a certain kind of creative edge. And once you enable people to think about these things in a creative way, they stop being stuck. So normally in a survival situation or a crisis, what happens is that people's minds turn to look at the situation, discover it's too confusing, and fill up with just nonsense. Over and over and over again, you hear stories of people who get lost in the wilderness and do completely, impossibly stupid things. <laughs> because they didn't know what to do, they weren't able to think clearly because they were afraid, and as a result, they made absolutely fantastic cock-ups. So when you make something simple enough that people understand it here rather than here, 
it becomes something that they show mastery over. Um, does anybody remember when Google only did search and there was just a white page and you typed in what you wanted to know and it told you and how much it, it was nice? And then it got more and more complicated to the point where nobody really feels like they understand Google anymore. It's got something like 70 different services. And the search thing, you could type in all kinds of weird options and make it do all kinds of doggy tricks. And suddenly it doesn't feel so comfortable because we don't really understand it. And we know that it's kind of watching us. And you know it just feels too big and too complicated and too intrusive for us to really feel comfortable. And that is a very important thing about mental models, about toolkits, about teaching, you have to make it so simple that the people that you're talking to understand it completely. And once they understand it completely, they treat it as a building block and then they go off and do something on top of it, they build with it, they build on top of it. Until they understand it completely, they're always nervous and they keep coming back to you and saying, but are we, I'm assured about this, and they keep seeking reassurance rather than having confidence to go and do things. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. yeah. So it's very important, right? <laughs> given all the technologies that you're building and given all the things you're hoping to document, it's very important to get people to the point of total confidence because then they go off and they teach and they show and they demonstrate and so on. When they still have a little not understanding and a little doubt, generally speaking, they just won't move at all. So, second part. Seven tiers of government. So we've got six ways to die, and they divide into three pairs. Too hot and too cold is shelter. Hunger and thirst is supply. Illness and injury is safety. And too hot and too cold is normally a building. Uh, hunger and thirst is normally supply chains. So it's, it's literally things are brought to you to stop these things happening. And illness and injury are generally speaking protective services, like hospitals and police and so on. It's also basic industrial safety. You don't cut yourself. So these seven tiers of governance uh, are a very simplified way of thinking about how the world works. So the seven tiers, individual, household, village, town, region, country, world. So the UN is part of the world system. The Greek government or the Greek police are part of the national system. Uh, if there's some kind of island assembly that helps do some things for the island, like run tourism, that would be a regional thing. The local town, what's the next, what's the big town just across the bridge from the uh, mainland? Algeria. Yeah, right. So that's got a municipal government, the city level. Inside of a city you've got neighbourhoods, or for you guys you're building your own village. Kind of a village? Village? Maybe. It's more like a kind of monastery almost. <laughs> yeah. A monastery for very unusual people. Have uh, you ever home. heard of uh, doing stand-up career? Say again? Stand-up stand career. Yes, I, I used to have a, a fellow that I would occasionally play who was a very, very naughty Indian Swami who told bad jokes. Uh, that was quite fun. Oh, no, it is not going to work that way. Your karma is very, very, very naughty. <laughs> Was, I used to do it at part. But you're very good in, in standing up. <laughs> good in standing up. Look, I need a stick to help you. Oh, it's a good start. start. Oh. Yeah, I could be the new Bill Hicks, only I don't have quite as much uh, cynicism. So, what you have is a, a matrix, right? Various ways to die and various tiers of government. So, you come out to injury, and the official story is that the police are basically municipal in most places, they're run by the town and the army is the national, and these things are there to protect you from injury. Right? You go out here to... Yeah, there it goes. Start again. So, this, uh, this notion is very, very, very important, and it's already started. So, uh, you know Gaza in Palestine? Mm -hmm. So, the Israelis cut off all kinds of different material supplies and all kinds of different services, which keeps them in a very, very weak condition. Uh, the Chinese government cut off the water supply to a town that was in insurrection. Um, I've got a couple other examples of these on my blog. I'm just trying to remember what they are. Uh, Egypt, they cut off the water supply to an area that was in insurrection. And there's a couple other examples recently. So that approach of choking off the supply chains is the modern equivalent of a siege. 
But in the old days, because people stored food and they stored water and they stored weapons, siege didn't work very well. It took months to have a siege. Now, if you were going to have a siege of a major city, it would take about, I don't know, two or three days. You block the port, you turn off the water, you turn off the electricity, and you wait for them to fry and choke each other. Eh. Doesn't sound very much fun, does it? Um, so it's very, very, very important for our political autonomy that we are able to stand on our own feet as far as the critical infrastructure goes. And this is a very, very, very heavy responsibility. Because the point about critical infrastructure is, when you screw it up, people die. That's what makes it critical. Making sense? Yeah. Right? I mean, toilets, right? We all know that when you get your composting toilet right, it is perfect. When you get it wrong, it's a bit dodgy. But if you get it really wrong, it contaminates your groundwater and then everybody gets cholera. Right? Hmm. We've got to get these designs really, really finished, and we have to get them to give us clear evidence of when they're not working properly. Right? Bacterial testing of water to make sure that it's clean and make sure that the toilets have not contaminated it is a really critical thing to learn. And you guys are unusually technically capable for a group doing this kind of back-to-the-land stuff, so figure out bacterial testing of water quality. Uh, you know about appropriate technology? Mm -hmm. right. So there's quite a few appropriate technology water testing systems out there. Right now, nobody has taken that technology and turned it into something that people in the alternative world can use. And that's a really important bit of science that needs to be done. And it's a very powerful thing because everybody wants to think their water is clean, but nobody ever tests the bloody stuff. You can send it to a lab, but it'd be nice to be able to do it at home. Um, Water. You give it to a dog first, and you wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, I've seen That's what dogs. Why we have plenty. I've seen what dogs <laughs> eat, and all I got to say is, I cannot eat what a dog can eat, <laughs> and I definitely can't drink what a dog can drink. Right? Um, the reason it matters is if lots of people follow the example that we're setting, some of them will be muppets. Right? <clears throat> and when the muppets start copying you, the muppets start making muppet-style mistakes. And at that point, you wind up with a problem, which is you were smart enough to tell when you had a problem, and they're not smart enough to tell. And then they keep doing the thing which is causing the problem until they've got people who've got real problems, and then they come back and they blame you. Right? I was very careful with the Hexiart project to never tell people that it was ready for them to build. Ready? Ready. I always said, look, it's a research project. If you want to try building one, make sure you document any problems you find out. We don't have structural engineering. We don't have really good instructional materials. We're still working on this. It's in alpha. Because eventually, somebody will build a wooden hexer, they'll do it wrong, and it will fall in their heads. And I don't carry professional insurance to cover that kind of risk because I'm not doing this thing as a business. So if you're going to get lots of people following you, you have to take the critical nature of this infrastructure seriously. Because as they begin to follow, they're less capable than you are, which is why they're following and not leading. And if they make mistakes, they'll blame you for the mistakes. So it's very important to get the critical infrastructure stuff right, because it really is life-saving. Right? If they'd had the composting toilet in Europe a thousand years ago, they would have made it to the mood by 1300 AD. Right? And at the end of the day, it's a brick-lined pit, or it's a hole in the ground that you made waterproof with lime. They could have built these things hundreds of years ago if they had the scientific knowledge. So, you know, it's very, very, very important that we finish these processes to the point where they're genuinely safe, they're properly documented, we've got some ability to tell by examination whether one is correct or not, and we can test for problems like water quality issues. You know, I can't stress how important it is that we cover this terrain, because if we wind up with a really big problem, uh, we could see... 200 million new composting toilets within 10 years. Wow, that'd be a lot of fun, but we'd have to make sure they worked. Now, let's come forward to this. You guys more or less see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to read it and, and uh, explain something. So, we've talked about the seven tiers of organisation across the top, haven't we? Individual, household, village or neighbourhood, municipality, region, city, world. So, individuals are individuals, mostly. 
household is in village households and villages are groups. And a group is any kind of social organization that shares some resources. We'll cover what kind in a second. Then you get to organizations and towns and regions are organizations. So an organization is a group that has a shared map of reality, a shared plan relative to that map, and a shared succession model. So if you have to change the leadership for some reason, there's a procedure to do it. And those three things are what produce the fire service, the ambulance service, the church, all of these organizations which have some kind of continuity beyond any given individual figure, shared map, shared plan, shared way of replacing the leadership. And that agreement has to be making, made before you have to change the leadership. Otherwise, what you have is a power struggle, which is typical of a tribal group or a war wordism. Um, you know, villages, the leadership might be male or female. It's usually an old person. It's usually a smart old person that's got lots of friends. Mm. If that person dies, replacing them is a kind of struggle within the society. There's no procedure to follow. You become an organization when you make a procedure and you say, when this one dies, the deputy is promoted. That's how you do it. Then we get to the country and the world, and these are states. They have state-like power. What makes a state is uh, a topic of very heavy political discourse. Have you guys heard of a guy by the name of Max Weber? Mm, yeah, right? yeah. So Weber says that the state is the single entity which has a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence in a geographical area. Basically, the state's the only person that's allowed to beat you with a stick inside of a boundary. Um, in practice, in most of the areas where you've got political violence in the world, there is not too little state, but there's too much. You've got two, three, four entities all competing for the right to be called the state, and you've got violence between them. This is true in refugee camps, it's true in civil wars, it's true in places like Gaza. So Weber's definition doesn't give you any help in the place you most need it, which is where there's trouble. Um, is that still recording, Christopher? Yeah. Good. Good. Just being paranoid. Mm -hmm. So, um, my definition of the state is very different from Weber's definition. My definition is the state is the en is any entity that can issue a pardon for a crime after you've been caught. Mm -hmm. Right? The state is what can get you off. So, this definition of the state accepts that if you're in a place like Naples and you've got an enormously corrupt police force and a very strong mafia, and you've got the Italian government, either the mafia or the police can turn out to be the state in any given situation. Because, you know, Joe has a word with Fred and says, look, you know, this guy, you need to lose the file or we're going to have a real problem. And, you know, he loses the file because he's more afraid of you than he is of the prime minister. Right? At that point, the state authority has gone to the mafia. Uh, in somewhere like Gaza, you've got probably five state-like actors. You've got the Israelis, you've got the Israeli military, you've got Hamas, you've got Hezbollah, and you've got the Palestinian Authority. I know I'm not too up-to-date on that situation, but I think the count is about five. Um, lots and lots and lots of times you wind up with complicated situations with lots of state-like actors. If you see really serious political trouble in Europe in probably two to four years, probably what you're going to see is syndicalist movements or communist movements assuming state responsibility in either the cities or the countryside, and then there'll be all kinds of struggles about whether what these people are doing is legal or not. If they win, they're going to call their fighting legal. If they lose, they're all going to be tried as criminals. What they're fighting for is the ability to pardon their own crimes, which were committed in the course of gaining the ability to pardon their own crimes. You see how that all seems a bit circular? Yeah, that's why I don't believe in violent revolution. Now, um, uh, so we talked about organizations, we talked a little bit about the state. Should I talk any more about the state, or is that enough about the state? Yeah, alright, good. Lovely. So, the last thing I'll talk about here is groups. So, what turns a group of individuals into a group that actually functions as a group has three preconditions. and. Most of the time when people think about groups and preconditions, they're talking about uh, the sort of social and the psychological mechanisms necessary to make a group. I don't have any opinion on that stuff. It's too complicated, and I'm a computer programmer, and we're not very good at people. Um, but what I can talk about is the technology required to support a group's actual function. You need three things, right? 
we're all sitting here in a space that we're sharing. That's the first thing you need as a group, you need a shared space. The second thing you need is a way to get to the shared space. And the third thing you need is communications to arrange when to be there. <laughs> right? So without communications, transportation and a shared space, it's very difficult for a group to function. So think about the infrastructure that you guys have, right? You've got some access to vehicles, you've got some transport provided by the local companies and the state. You've got cell phones and you've got internet up the road. And you've got three or four facilities. And all of those systems work together to give you a place to have a community in. But it's important not to neglect the communications and the transport as parts of that picture, because in practice they're incredibly important. A lot of communities are very focused on getting space, but actually getting transport and getting communications is just as important. So does all that kind of make sense in the abstract? Yeah. Okay, now, this is the good part. So, right now, all of the legitimacy of government and all the rest of that stuff is down here. State level, national and international. And this is the part which has completely blown its credibility by bankrupting most of our societies. What the hell were they thinking? I don't know. <laughs> Stupid! Right? Mm -hmm. So, as this begins to crumble, all of this section undoes itself. Land registration, social cohesion, rule of law, jurisdiction, uh, the legal definition of truth, all of that stuff collapses, right? And you could imagine that if we didn't have a state, if the drug companies were still able to release new drugs, they'd stop having rigorous testing, they'd just chuck any old crap in a bottle and tell you it was good for you. Mm -hmm. And they'd print money in the process. The ability to legally challenge somebody and say, you are lying and it's hurting people, is something that right now is contained within the function of the state. And as the state weakens, what you'll see is corporate lies go completely unchallenged as if they were fiction, as if they were legal truth. The state's ability to divide truth from fiction goes from being bad to being non-existent. As all of that section just falls out of use, huge amounts of responsibility fall on the region and on the municipality. Right? Suddenly, it's the mayor and the chief of police that are interpreting the law because the national court system doesn't work anymore. Some of the police still show up for work. Some of the judges are willing to work, you know, occasionally. Mostly people are staying at home and attempting to sort out their own affairs. And you wind up with a much more improvised approach to running a government. What collapses in that situation is this thing here, resource control. Resource control is the boundary around the thing that you need to stay alive. It's what means that your car is your car. It's what means that the water coming out of this well is your water. It's what says that the church that you uh, happen to go to is only used as a church, and it doesn't wind up with a whole bunch of people living in it. Right? Resource control is supported all the way up society through the state. It's contract law. It's legal agreements to make things like companies or charities. It's the ability to buy a piece of land and actually get a property deed that says the land is yours. All of that material is supported from up here, and this is the level that's getting into trouble. So as this crumbles, as it's already doing in some areas, where you get hit is the ability to hang onto your resources because the state no longer makes sure that what you say is yours is yours. And this is the critical challenge for communities. The communities have to take over the responsibility for managing the resource pools locally. Who gets the water? Who gets the power? Who gets the food? Is it the same people the state gave it to? Is it the people who need it most? Who gets to decide? Does this kind of make sense? You know, what I'm talking about is that practical bones of revolution. Who actually gets to drink this water is the core revolutionary question. Who gets to live in this house is the core revolutionary question. It is not a revolution until you start breaking property rights. Now, I think that what we're going to see is a massive rearrangement in the basic structure of the economy, and it might turn out to not break property rights on the way. Um, you could easily see 200,000 unemployed Spanish youth relocated into 200,000 empty houses. Right? Everybody gets a house instead of a job. Take what you don't have, turn it into what you do have. Everything might work fine if you did that. 
Let's do a capital A. Thank you. Um, so, with all this stuff gone, right, you sort of have to think of how the world looks. With, with that section just banished. All of this goes, most of this goes as well. Now, what do you have up there? Uh, international food markets, international fuel markets, army, large scale import and export from the docks because you can't necessarily arrange the financing anymore. Communications, transport, and workspace are supported by the oil, but they're also supported by uh, the electrical grid and port systems. Ports are really, really complicated. They take a ton of resources to operate. Modern ports are amazingly efficient, therefore they're incredibly fragile. Uh, oil terminals, like a port, but even more complicated, also very flammable. Very, very difficult. As this stuff begins to hit trouble, again, massive force, regional, municipal, village, neighbourhood. So you wind up with this section of the map, right? Everything up to resource control, region, municipality, as a block that has to figure out how to continue to function. Now, this is a very detailed and technical way of discussing something that lots of people know already, which is if central government runs into a problem, we're going to have to take care of the local area ourselves. The technical side of it is, what does it mean to take care of the local area? What are the actual set of needs that you have to cover? Well, illness, injury, thirst, hunger, too cold, too hot. So if you do the analysis for the local area that you're in, from this very simple matrix, you begin to get some very interesting answers. Too hot. A few people probably die of being too hot every year, but generally speaking, Greeks don't seem to be that dependent on air conditioning at home. Um, if you did it in Texas, really, really big problems. Too cold. A few mountain villages, they don't need very much fuel, probably not a problem. Um, thirst? How much clean water do you have? Well, Is now, enough. enough. Enough, right? Yeah. Mountain springs, beautiful rivers, probably fine for water. Irrigation is another question. Food. Uh, four times the land per person that we have in Britain, but the land is pretty pretty scraggly in a lot of places. Does Greece produce enough food to feed itself? Uh, if it's yeah. base consumption, no. Uh, yeah, so we're not sure. Right. Might be worth doing some research on. Usually what you find is if you eat all of the farm animals in the first year, in the second year you can grow enough food to feed everybody. <laughs> um, then we get to illness and injury. So injury, generally speaking, if you don't anticipate a massive increase in violence, you might get a few people who get injured, you might need to take them to a hospital, the hospital might be understaffed. The place where you're already getting pounded is illness. This story that's circulating about uh, certain cancer drugs are no longer coming into Greece because the companies don't think they'll get paid. Mm -hmm. right? That's the beginning of a problem. Uh, I have a friend who lives in the Canary Islands. Canary Islands population of 2 million people and 7,000 of those people need insulin to live. Right? The insulin comes from Germany. They fly it in. They've got 100 days of water and they make more drinking water by burning diesel to run desalination. Right? So, in Greece, particularly up here where you've got lots of water and lots of land, absolutely manageable problems. If you go to very, very exposed areas like the Canaries, or you go to very, very cold areas like Boston, you wind up with situations where if you've got an infrastructure collapse because the government has fallen to pieces, you're going to wind up with really huge humanitarian crisis. Unthinkably huge humanitarian issues. Uh, and I don't really know anybody that's worrying about that. I've been trying to, you know, whack the governments again and again and again, right? How do you notice that if you lose the national grid for three months because somebody screws something up, you're going to wind up with 30 million people freezing to death in the north of your country? People just won't listen to it, right? It's obvious the grid is fragile. It's obvious they're using the grid to stay warm. It's obvious if the grid goes down, they're going to freeze. You can't get people interested. I've been screaming about the supply chain for insulin for about four years, uh, you just can't get people moving, right? There aren't that many, many places that make it. It stockpiles really well. You can keep it in a fridge for 20 years. 
but how big is the national insulin uh, stockpile? And if there is a crisis, how do you get the insulin out of the stockpile and into your diabetic mother? Right? Unsolved problems. If you take a medication, if you take birth control, if there's a supply chain issue because the euro collapses, you go to the drachma and it all gets screwed up, you could have three months when you can't get your medication. It probably won't be ten years, it probably won't be two years, but two months, three months, just because the bureaucracy collapses, very imaginable. Go to your doctor and try and get a 90-day prescription. Usually they're just not allowed to write one. It's doctor, one, would... one week here, not 90 days. One week, right? So we have all of this fragility that's being forced on us because they will not give us the drugs that we need to stay alive. Uh, can you guarantee me that this will always be here when I come for it? Could I have that in writing, please, mortgaged against your house? Uh, no. Then why are you putting me at risk by not letting me make my own decisions about when to take my goddamn pill? Right? It's a really serious problem that nobody's really addressing. I keep trying to take this story to transition towns, and the transition towns approach is, we've got a community garden, it's great! Uh, yeah, but you've also got a lot of old people in transition towns, many of whom are quite dependent on a lot of complicated medications. How do you consider you might need to start worrying about them? Doesn't get through. Right? So, you know, you guys are young, you're strong, you're very ambitious, you're very well educated, you're very professional, and you do good engineering have a whole bunch of new responsibility. Right? Okay. <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> Tag! You're it! Right? Because, as this whole thing begins to unwind, maybe it will be a flesh wound and it won't get all that serious and we'll get through it in one piece. Maybe it will turn out to be the worst clusterfuck since World War II. Right? We don't really know, but with this tool, you can do a very, very tight analysis which will tell you the very bare minimum that people need to survive, but you have to be fearless when you do the planning. You have to think about the very young, under six months, under five years. You have to think about the very old, not just the 70-year-olds, the 90-year-olds, and not just the healthy people, but also the sick people. The ones on antidepressants, uh, the ones with long-standing medical issues, the ones who might need a surgery. Um, you have to think about the women. Birth control, very, very common. If it becomes unavailable, what the hell is plan B? Right? Not safe. Ooh, Ooh, fucked up. Oh, <laughs> right. You know, suddenly, no well, right. welcome to the 14th century. You can't have sex anymore, so you have to keep the men and women in separate cages. Right? I think the solution is fuck, isn't it? Uh, you know, it's just, you've got to decide whether you want to face a collapse with no, a six no, no. month... No, what, what was the meaning of F-U-C-K? Oh. Uh, fertilization under kings, uh, something, clarification, yeah. Oh, I see. Ah, that fuck. <laughs> that fuck. Right? People ask me, what should they stockpile for the, you know, apocalypse if it comes? And I say, you know, what you want is an enormous bag of cheap Chinese condoms. <laughs> Right? The ultimate trade good. Right? You need condoms and vodka. The two go together very well. It's raining dry orgasms. Right? I mean, you know, if that stuff worked, there wouldn't be any Tibetan monks. Um, all of these questions, you know, five years ago when I started worrying about this stuff, it was all a long way away. Oh my god, we're screwed, but we got some time. Now, I'm just walking around the world like, we're screwed tomorrow. Right? Maybe it will run another two years, maybe it will collapse, maybe it will collapse all at once, maybe it will collapse in some places and not others. But there are already people dying because they couldn't get access to their medicines. There are already people dying because of the stress of not knowing what will happen and losing their jobs. We're already beginning to see the collapse of the economy turning into a humanitarian crisis. And that process is only going to get worse and it's only going to spread until we restructure our societies in a way that actually uses the resources we have to provide for the needs we have. And I don't know how we get there from here without a revolution or without massive unthinkable political change, but what I do know is, however it happens, it's going to be complicated and messy, and this is the best I have for holding shit together in the meantime. So, that is what I had to say. Um, Thank you. Well, lovely stuff you're doing up here. Um, the one other thing that I will talk about very briefly is this concept of jurisdiction. Right? Jurisdiction is what is the law and who gets to decide how it's interpreted. Start reading about jurisdiction. Right? How is a jurisdiction created? How is it maintained? What's a judge? What's a jury? 
if you know that stuff really well and the local systems become corrupt or stop working, you have the ability to re-establish an independent court, and re-establishing an independent court is a profoundly important social service. So, that was the other thing. Right. All right. Any questions? Ah, there we go. Just in time. Oh, do you want to see the Greek one of these? Ta da! So, this was translated by my friend Petros Morris. And uh, apparently, it's all pretty good. So, there we have it. Now, can we keep this? Yeah, of course. Cool. It's, uh, it's online. The... He means the laptop. <laughs> Aha! I have a stick! Uh, resiliencemaps.org. Ah, yeah, yeah. BrazilianMaps.org. So you yeah, could get this yeah. whole document in Greek, in Spanish, and in English. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's under a Creative Commons license, so you could take it and you could build things out of it and you could give it to people. It's under a non-commercial license, so that I can't get ripped off by Halliburton. And you're looking for translations Oh yeah, other languages would be great. Yeah. Right, uh, I mean, uh, uh, like Tamara, right? Speaker. Could Tamara find a use for it, maybe? Um, oh, there's, I keep forgetting little details. The other really useful concept is the bureaucracies of sharing. So when you have something which is shared, you have three bureaucracies. The one that owns it, the one that manages it, and the one that guards it. And anytime you're sharing something, you have to make those three bureaucracies explicit. Uh, otherwise, they'll become implicit and impossible to address or think about or discuss. It's another little detail. Sorry, there's just a lot of stuff. Um, bu -bu -bum. Translators would be very useful. Uh, actually doing a detailed map for a given location, like doing this stuff for here, publishing the details, showing the technologies you're using to cover those needs, really, really useful. Yeah. And as a planning tool, you know, what you do is you basically assign responsibilities to cover different pieces of the map and it provides an overview so that you know that you haven't forgotten anything when you start doing the planning work. Yeah, it's fun. How many of those important needs you think are already solved? Not necessarily... Uh, 100% uh, functional, but solved or they are worked on, and how many they're totally untouched? Hmm. So, uh, too hot and too cold are pretty much solved. You know, clothes from knitting or for weaving, housing, shade, done. Uh, hunger, lots of work on permaculture, lots of old farming techniques, lots of ways of cheating. So, Hunger is a huge problem, but it's also a problem that's got a lot of resources on it.